Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. We'll be doers of it and see the fruit of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you now on the subject of the call of God. Every one of us has a calling, and that calling is something that's to be fulfilled in our life. We begin in Hebrews 3.1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. You have a heavenly calling upon you. And this calling is to be fulfilled in your life so you'll be chosen. God wants us to understand this heavenly calling is for those who are the holy brethren who are going to walk in all of His ways and be chosen and be found faithful before the Lord. We talked about many scriptures and we went through many of the scriptures talking about the call of God this morning and we're going to continue on this evening. We're going to begin with John chapter 2, a passage of scripture we've talked about many times in the past but it relates now to the subject we're talking about. Verse 1, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. That was a marriage that did take place. Notice it's a marriage, just a marriage between somebody. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and His disciples to the marriage. Now we're talking about a different marriage. The marriage is referring to the one important marriage, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when do we enter into that? It's on the third day. When is the third day? Well, it's after the two days of the church age. And then the third day begins. And that's the time during that after the three and a half years of the third day when the tribulation period occurs. At the end of that, when Jesus comes in fulfillment of the rapture to catch the church up to meet the Lord in the air, then we will be there in the marriage, the marriage that it speaks of. And notice who gets coming to this. Who's called? Jesus, of course, He's the bridegroom, and disciples, not just Christians, not just those born again, but disciples. That means you've got to be a disciple to be in this marriage. And so it's a call of God for you to be a disciple, a true disciple before the Lord. Now, we see that this is a case where they were lacking wine at this particular um, marriage, a marriage. But we see the spiritual principle that's so important for us to understand. Because want really means that they were becoming behind or lacking this. And wine speaks of fruitfulness. It has a spiritual revelation that's important to understand because he's talking about those who are going to be disciples. And before we go through this for a moment, let's just jump over to something else. They'll even show you, point out why what we're bringing forth is important. John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You've got to be fruitful and bring, bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Therefore, that means if these the ones that are disciples are called, they have to be people, people who are bearing much fruit. Well, you're going to see that that's what this is all about. So they were lacking wine, which is a type of pointing towards fruitfulness. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. What hour is he talking about? He's talking about the hour when he would be able to bring forth the fruitfulness. When is that? In the New Testament era, when the New Testament had come into being. The New Testament was not in, being, in force at this time. Jesus was coming. Of course, he's going to accomplish the redemption and then bring in the New Testament into being when he was the firstborn from the dead and became the heir of that New Testament, and which he made between the Father and, and, and himself. And he had to fulfill the first, take away the first, before he could establish the second, which is the New Testament. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he says, says unto you, do it. That's exactly what we need to do if we're going to see him accomplish this work to bring forth fruitfulness. Whatever he says, we need to do it. There were six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Water pots of stone. You and I are living stones in the house of God. We are water pots. 
and we are to contain the water. Water is a type of the Word of God. And so what was the purpose of this? For the purifying or the cleansing this means. So the water in us is going to produce the cleansing. And the cleansing must come forth before we're going to come to the place of being disciples. In fact, before we go further, let's go back to John 15 for a moment. You can see this. Remember in verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away. But every branch that bears fruit, he cleanses it, purges, cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Meaning you have to go through the cleansing process before you can bring forth more fruit, and then you come to the abiding place where you can bring forth much fruit. So, as we see here, this is the case where this water pot, which is what you and I are, is to get filled up with water for the cleansing to occur in your life. And so, Jesus said, whatever he says, you know, you do it. Fill the water pots with water. You and I are the water pots. We're to be filled with the water of the Word of God. They filled them up to the brim completely. He wants you filled up with the water. Remember, what's supposed to be in you is only the Word of God. Remember what was in the ark? Only the, uh, the tablets that were in there? <laughs> That's all that was in there. That was the Word of God, the where the Word was written on those tables of stone in the Old Testament. All that's supposed to be in you is the Word. And he said to him, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it out. <clears throat> when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, that not was made wine. The word made means to become. The water, which speaks of the word in us, filling us up, became wine, which refers to fruitfulness. When you and I get filled up with the word of God, we're going to see the fruitfulness come forth from the word in us. And this, when it speaks of became, this means what the result of this will produce in the past, perfect tense, by God, because it's a passive voice, the work that He will do in us to bring us to the place of being fruitful. And that is what this is speaking of. And so he comes to verse 10, he says, Every man at the beginning to set forth good wine, when men have well drunk that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine, this is the excellent wine, until now. For the excellent fruitfulness until now, which is speaking of for who? The ones are going to be the disciples that are going to be there at the time of the third day to enter into the marriage. That's the end time church it's speaking of that are going to have the great fruitfulness. And this beginning of signs, miracles also means signs because this is a sign to all who is going to be a disciple. The ones who get filled up with the word, go through the cleansing process, and when you do so, that word will become fruitful in your life. And you're going to be, come to the place of being a disciple because you're going to be full of the fruit because you're going to be abiding in the Word of God. Sign is what it's translated the most of the time. The beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. And what happened then as well? He manifests forth His glory. Because when you become fruitful and you are, as a true disciple, you will see the glory of God manifested because you are full of the Word of God and you've been cleansed. The glory of God, God will only manifest in a vessel that's been cleansed and it's holy before Him. And that's what disciples must be. So that's the calling of God. This speaks of what you and I are called to do. We're called to get the Word in us. We're called to see this cleansing occur. So we come to the place of fruitfulness. So then we will see the glory of God poured out on this end time church. We see another thing that's important over in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as the thief and a robber. Who's the thief and the robber? It's the devil. Well, how did he get into the sheepfold to have effect upon us? How did he get in to be able to get to man? It was through Adam's sin, wasn't it? Is that the way you're supposed to come in? No. How do you come into the earth? By physical birth. How did Jesus come into the earth? By physical birth. Now the devil came in by getting him to sin, and that's how he came in, by Adam's sin. He's the, come, is the, th the one who's the thief and the robber. 
Well, Jesus comes in. He said, he that entered in by the door, and that door is the door of physical birth, is the shepherd of the sheep. So now he's the great shepherd of the sheep. You and I are to be the sheep following him closely. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. The sheep are the ones that are following him closely, and they're going to be called. They're calling his sheep by name. He knows them. He's developed a personal, intimate fellowship with them. That's what you're called to. You're called to be a sheep. You're called to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord where he knows you. You know him. He calls his own sheep by name. And then he leads them out. And so he puts forth his own sheep. He goes before them. When it talks about putting forth, this means really to send out. It's the same word for cast out, but in this situation, it would mean to be sent out, sent forth. So he sends forth his own sheep. And what's he send us forth to? To go forth and preach the gospel and do the mighty works of the Lord and carry out the work of God. He goes before them. He goes before us, remember, to prepare the way and to lead us and guide us where do we go. And the sheep follow him, but they know his voice because they've developed a personal, intimate fellowship. If you are going to be one of the ones that's a disciple, one of the ones that's going to know the Lord and walk in his ways and fulfill the call of God, you're going to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him. You're going to follow him. You're going to obey him. You're going to be a sheep who's walking closely with him at all times. And then it says, a stranger will they not follow? Well, a stranger is not someone that's of the Lord. That's someone that's, that would be the type of the evil one or evil spirits or people that are used of the devil who would be tried to draw you in another direction contrary to the word. We're not going to be following strangers. Now, why? It says stranger, they'll not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. That means they haven't been hearing from strangers. God doesn't want you to hear anything from strangers. He wants you to only hear the things from the Lord. You need to separate yourself from anything that is not of God. You don't want any strange voices coming into you that are contrary to the word. We come down to verse 10. We see what the devil seeks to do. The thief, the enemy, Satan, cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm come, they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. When it says to steal, to kill, to destroy, they're not infinitives in the Greek. Instead, they are subjunctive mood verbs. Here's the first one. Not an infinitive, it's subjunctive mood. How would you translate that? The thief cometh not but that he might steal, and that he might kill, a subjunctive mood, and that he might destroy. That means he can't do it unless conditions are met. And how would he be able to operate? Well, if you give place to him from sin, he can come in. Or if you don't resist him when he attacks you, he can attack you whether even if you're not in sin. If you don't learn to use your weapons of warfare and resist the enemy, so he'll flee from you and conquer him with the word. Jesus spoke the word to extinguish the attacks of the enemy. So you can't give place to sin, and you've got to know the word to deal successfully with anything he brings at, and he won't be able to get to you. He has to have conditions met to steal, kill, or destroy. Jesus says, I am come. They might be having life. This is also a subjunctive mood, that they may be having continually, present tense, life if they meet the conditions. In like manner, you know, the conditions have to be met for the Lord to manifest life, and that they might be having it more abundantly. Same thing. This is, again, a subjunctive mood verb indicating the fact that there's conditions for you to have the life of God. So you can't be given place to the devil and let him work. You've got to be doing what God says and meeting his conditions so you can see the life of God manifest, and it will be more abundantly manifest in you. It's what he's called us to. He wants us to have his life. He wants us to know him and follow in his ways. We come down to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is certainly someone who's responding to the call of God because he's a sheep who draws nigh unto him. He's right on the heels of the shepherd. Notice he hears my voice. He's close enough to hear his voice. That's as you're in the Word. You're getting filled up with the things of God. 
You're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And he says, I know them, and they follow me. Why would he know us? Because we have drawn nigh to him, so he draws nigh to us, and we have walked in his ways to develop this personal, intimate fellowship with him. Those are the ones who are going to be fulfilling the call of God. That is what he expects of every one of us, to be a true sheep. Remember, there's a separation he talks about later in the scriptures about, uh, about the sheep and the goat, goats. The sheep, they follow the Lord. The goats, they just wander and do whatever they want to do. The sheep are the ones that enter into eternal life. The goats, they get cast out. We cannot be a goat that's doing whatever we want. We must be a sheep who is following him at all times. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, it speaks there about when they got born again and then they received the Holy Spirit. And we see that in Acts 2.38 where he talked about that they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 39, for the promise. The promise of what? Of receiving the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a promise, remember. Not talking about getting born again. Just talking about the Holy Spirit being received. Remember, the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. How do we know the Holy Spirit's a promise, by the way? Well, we continue on with that. We know that because what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, over here in verse 13, he says that they trusted in the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is a promise that we receive and when do you get a promise? Once you're born again. So he's talking here, and the reason we're sharing this because of what we're going to say in a moment, he speaks of this promise of receiving the Holy Spirit. It's to you and to your children and to all that are far off. So that would mean all the succeeding generations, which would include us and what's all in the past. Even as many as the Lord our God, not shall call here. <clears throat> is it underneath? Yeah, this is the word call. That he might call. Meaning, they have to have met conditions to be able to receive this promise. Well, what's the condition for you to be able to receive the promise? Being born again first. It's amazing how Christians have taught the line teaching saying that you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again, which is false. First, you get born again, and what do you get? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of promise, and that's why it has a, it's a subjunctive mood. It's conditional. You've got to be born again first before you can receive that promise. We see also, if we go back over to Ephesians, just to help you on this, so you don't let anybody try to confuse you. The Holy Spirit of promise, that's for people that are born again. What else is the Holy Spirit? Which is the earnest or the first fruit of our inheritance. When do you have an inheritance? Does the unbeliever have an inheritance? No. You've got to be born again, don't you? You've got to be a son, as it talks about. Look over here, and he talks about if children, well, that means they're born again, Romans 8, 17, then heirs. So you don't have any inheritance until you're born again. Well, if it's the first fruit of our inheritance, that means the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance. It's only for heirs. It doesn't come to you when you are born again and become a child. It comes to you as part of your inheritance because you have become a child. Here's another scripture that will help you to be able to answer any the, the false teachings that are out there, thinking that people get the Holy Spirit when they're born again. Luke 11, 13. The second part of that verse is, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Well, that means if someone who just doesn't know Him as His heavenly Father... It'd be if someone's not born again, can he just ask God to give him the Holy Spirit? No, he's not going to get anything. Where do you get the Holy Spirit from? From the Father. 
when can you get it from the Father? When He is your Father. Is He your Father before you're born again? No. When does He become your Father? When you have received Jesus and now you're born again. So, the person is asking His Heavenly Father to give Him the Holy Spirit. Obviously, He wouldn't be asking Him for it if He already had it. He doesn't have it yet. So, He's asking the Father to give Him the Holy Spirit. That shows you that you don't get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. You get the Holy Spirit as a promise, as part of your inheritance, from the Father. And also, does the Holy Spirit proceed from Jesus? No. Look what it says in John 15, 26. When the Comforters come, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send unto you, Jesus was involved in it, but where did He get it from? from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth. And then it tells you where He comes from, which proceedeth from the Father. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. What you get when you're born again is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as your Savior to get born again? No. You received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you got the Spirit of Christ that came into you. You got the Spirit that Jesus got for us. The Holy Spirit is what we get after we're born again. So that's why, just so you understand, that's why the subjunctive mood is there. You know, when you, you wonder well, why would there be conditions if they get the Holy Spirit when they get born again? No, the promise is talking about for people that are born again to receive the Holy Spirit after you're born again, and it's conditional upon what he, who he might call, which is conditional upon to receive the Holy Spirit. It's what he's talking about. He might call the, to get this promise. You've got to be born again first. Then you can receive the Holy Spirit. That's why the subjunctive mood is used there. Of course, what does this tell us? God wants everybody to receive it, but you have to meet the conditions first. You're called to receive this promise of the Holy Spirit, but you've got to be born again first to meet the conditions for it. Acts chapter 13. It's amazing how many Christians have not received the Holy Spirit yet. They haven't. So if they're not receiving it, they haven't fulfilled that part of the call of God upon their life. Everybody's called to get this promise of the Holy Spirit when you're born again. Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. A call was upon them to carry out a work. And what did they need to do? They needed to be separate. This is this word we've seen before. When you separate yourself from things that are not right, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where we saw about that, where you are to mark off from others by boundaries, set the boundaries, you separate yourself unto God and carry out what He wants for you so that then you can see the work be done. You certainly can't be involved in the things of the world or the things of sin or things that aren't of God if you're going to be able to carry out the work. So you set the boundaries. Separate me, set the boundaries for Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They've got to separate themselves unto that and carry it out in their life. That's the same thing for you. You're going to do the work of God, you're going to be separated unto Him. You can't have anything else contaminating you. It's going to affect you in trying to do the work of God. You've got to, do, you've got to be holy. You've got to be cleansed. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be, I've gone through the cleansing process to be useful. Remember what it says in 2 Timothy 2, 19 and 20, 21? It talks about that. So, and also, this also shows you it's the, what are, where, the work whereunto I have called them. That means you find out what God's called you to do. You don't make your own call. Well, I decide I'm going to do such and such. No, you're not going to make your own call. It's what God has called you to. That's why you walk in the general call that He has, and then you seek Him to reveal unto you what any specific call that He might have for you in your life. Of course, this means we're going to have to seek after the Lord. He'll reveal things to you as you meet the conditions for Him to use you. Acts 15, 17, The residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. You and I are to seek after the Lord. We're to seek after the Lord. 
When we seek, we'll find the things that he has for us so we can walk in all of his ways. Of course, every single one of us are called to preach the gospel. They're going forth, carrying out what they want them to do. And these guys, they're going from city after city. They come to Mysia, they say to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. The Holy Spirit will also be involved in leading you and guiding you and directing you, even though you're going forth in the call that God has brought, because the Holy Spirit's going to show you what the specifically you do along the way. In this case, they passed by Mysia, came down to Troas. Vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Well, now, pretty clear. When a vision comes, and this it was in this case, it's clear. Come over to Macedonia, and that's pretty clear. We want, that's where you're supposed to go next to preach the gospel. When God brings a vision to you, it will be clear. You don't try to interpret it and figure it out. He'll tell you exactly what he wants, or he'll show you the interpretation, exactly what he means. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, surely, surely gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Of course. No question about it. Don't try to interpret visions or any of these things. You believe the vision and know that what God is telling you to do as He reveals what you do, you go forth and carry it out in your life. We see too many people that try to interpret things that they get and they get off track. You need to follow what He says. In this case, of course, the vision sure was clear. We just need to get the revelation of it in light of what he's telling us to do, and then go forth and carry it out, which what happened. So they were going to preach the gospel, but you got to know that the Holy Spirit is going to be involved in leading you and guiding you in the steps that you're going to take, where you go, what you do, what you don't do, and so forth. We go over to Romans chapter 1, because remember, there's a general call, but there's also a specific call on your life, and you got to hear from the Lord and know what he wants you to do. You just don't decide to do what I want to do as far as specific things. No, you follow his directing you. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called, notice the to be, it's italicized. What does that tell you? It's not in the original whatsoever. It isn't there. What does this simply literally mean? As Young brings it out, a called apostle. He was called to have a, he got a ministry gift. He's a called apostle. Not to be apostle, he was a called apostle. Otherwise, that gift was given unto him, that calling was upon his life that he was to carry out. And of course, we already told you, when you have a specific call, what are you to do? He was to separate himself. Mark off from others by boundaries. Separate himself under the gospel of God. Get committed to follow and go that direction. That's what you do. You don't just decide to do things on how you want to do it. He had to be separated, set apart for the purpose of carrying this out. We come down to verse 6. Among whom you also are, you are, are you also the called of Jesus Christ. That tells us something that all believers are called of Jesus Christ. Don't think that you don't have a calling. We have a general calling carry out the general calling of what God has. If there's any specific things that he reveals to you, he will show you. And then you carry those out and follow after them. We see in verse 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called not to be saints, called saints. Called holy ones. It's an adjective. You and I were called holy ones. Because you got to be holy if you're going to be fulfilling the call of God. Remember, they had to be cleansed and be sanctified before they could be useful. Many people don't understand that. They just try to just launch into whatever they want to la launch in themselves. That's a mistake. Remember what it says over here in 2 Timothy 2, verse 19 and following, where... The foundation of God stands sure because you hear and doing the word, you get established and you have this seal confirmed, proved and authenticated that you're the real deal because you got the foundation laid. The Lord knows them are his. Those are the ones that are following after him, totally committed. Everyone that names the name of Christ, he's got it apart from unrighteousness. 
And he talks about the vessels. You know, you got, of course, got to be a vessel of honor if God's going to use you. So how do we become one? If a man therefore purge or cleanse out thoroughly himself from these, from the unrighteousness, he shall be a vessel unto honor. And what next is the key, what makes him a vessel of honor? He got cleansed and what happened? The sanctification process was accomplished in him. How do we know that? Because when it says sanctified, it means it's a perfect tense, completed action in the past with the present results now. It means it got done. The cleansing process produces the sanctification to bring you to the place of being holy. And of course, it's by the Lord because it's a passive voice. But then what after that? And meat for the master's use. So what precedes being used? You've got to be sanctified. You've got to get cleansed. Otherwise, work on the cleansing and being sanctified, and then God will be ready to use you like he wants to in specific callings, certainly. And you'll also be prepared unto every good work as you are going through this cleansing process and the sanctification work. Because this also, as you're being sanctified, they also were prepared for the work, perfect tense, in the past, by God, passive voice, accomplishing the work in us. Therefore, you must realize that you're called, you're to be a holy one. He said, called saints, these are the holy ones that were supposed to carry out the call of God on their life. We see something else that's important to understand. As God has called things, He wants you to call the same things, to bring things into being. It speaks of how God is calling those things which be not as though they were. That's how He brought things into being. And if you're going to fulfill the call of God, you're going to bring things into being too. Calling is something you're going to do as well. Is calling which what you're doing, present tense, continuous action, those things that are not being, they're not happening, as though not they were already done, it's a great mistake. The word be, present participle, translated being. The word were couldn't be a present tense participle if it was true because were is a past tense. But what is it? Here we are. Present participle. Being. It's the exact same word. Did they translate it right? No. That's why Jung says, is calling the things that be not as being. Otherwise, I'm going to call things that are not being as being, speaking them into being, to bring them into being. Not as though they were already done. This is the great error of the Word of Faith teaching. Word of Faith teaching declares that things are already done. I am already healed. I'm already set free. I just believe I am. That's a lie. Because they got it from this verse and some other things that they have seen or er looked at erroneously as well. No, we call those things not being as being to speak them into being. So you're going to put your faith in operation to see all the things that God wants to bring forth in your life, all you're called to, all the promises, whatever it would be, you're going to speak those things into being to release them. How did Jesus do everything? Be healed. Be opened. Be loosed. Be made whole. He didn't come up and say, you're already healed, just believe it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're already, your ears are already opened. Your tongue's already loosed. Just believe it. No. Where did they get this? They didn't get it from Jesus, that's for sure. They got it from not, from looking at this verse and not checking everything out as they should have and find out the fact that it's erroneously translated because it's a present participle. So, you're to call things into being. You take the promises, you speak them into being to release them to come to pass. It's important you learn how to confess God's word accurately based on the promises that belong to you, then you speak those things into being. The past tense verses tell you the promise. You speaking into being is what releases it to come to pass. That's why you declare what the Word says, the promise, and then you speak it into being to release that promise to come to pass by speaking 
present tense declarations of what he is doing for you now. I'll never forget long ago, God said, if you want to see me do something, you speak into being what you want me to bring into being based on the promise that belongs to you. You speak it into being to release him to bring it into being. That's how he does things. He spe he, you speak it into being, he brings it into being. You don't speak what he will do. He still, that's not releasing him to bring something into being. You speak it into being and he, he performs it and brings it into being. You're the spokesman that releases it as you command or you speak things into being. That's important. You've got to learn to call those things that are not being as being. If you're going to see the things that God's called you to do to come to pass, you bring it into being. I'm not going to declare that, well, God will heal me someday. Well, that's hope. Well, that's a good, that's okay, but that's not releasing anything. I'm going to say, I come boldly to the throne of grace, and because by his stripes I was healed, I come boldly and I take hold of your healing power, and your healing power is flowing into my body now. What am I doing? I'm calling those things not being as being. It's happening. It's happening now. I'm speaking into being. That's what you need to learn. If you want to see things come to pass, you've got to start calling things into being. Speak it into being. Well, I don't see it happening. You're that you're going to see it happening when you keep speaking and you keep speaking and speaking until it comes into being. We know that from casting out. We don't go up to someone and say, well, you're already free of the devils now. Just believe it. No. We say, come out in the name of Jesus. Well, that's speaking the same thing. I'm speaking something into being by commanding that to come out now. Right? right. That's how we function. Faith is always now. You're speaking things into being. Hope is what God will do for you, confident expectancy. Faith is what brings the hope into being by speaking it into being. Next, we come to another passage of Scripture which has been highly misunderstood by people. Romans 8, 28. The King James says, We know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So people have concluded now that all things are working together for my good. Period. The car accident must be working together for my good somehow. That sickness, disease, it was working together for good because you know all things are working together for my good. No, they're not. The things of the devil are not working together for your good whatsoever. So, what do we see here? First of all, we've got to see what it's really saying. When it says here, we, have no, we know or we have known, as he brings out, it's a perfect tense verb, not all things working together. In the Greek, here it is, and... We have known that, here it says, to those, is what this is, loving present participle, that's the word for love, the God, that's the way I always put it, the God referring to what, that specific person, to those loving God, well that now changes the whole thing. And now we've got a condition brought here. So those loving God is what we're going to be talking about. Is everybody loving God? Nope. No. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you're not keeping the commandments, are you loving God? No. Not according to God. Well, you may have an attitude, but that doesn't work. Jesus said, if you keep my sayings, those are the ones that love me. You know. So the ones who are keeping his commandments and doing his word, keeping his sayings, those are the ones that are loving him. So now we have a qualifying statement here. To those loving God. So that's the condition. All things here are working together, which is true, into or unto good. To here, now it speaks of here, to those, and here is the, the word, the verb for it, to those being called ones. Because this is an adjective, plural. That's how you would see this in the Greek. To those being called ones according to, that's what this word is, his pr a purpose, what he's called you to. 
And I, you don't know Greek, but I was trying to walk you through as best as I could to kind of show you how you would understand this because their order is not like our order. It's different. A lot of times the verbs are at the end and so forth. So this literally says that we have known that to those loving God, the condition, all things are working together unto good. Well, if you're doing his commandments and you're keeping his sayings and you're doing everything he says, will everything be working for good? Sure it will be because you're putting God in operation on everything and you're just doing the word all the time and God will be performing all these great things in your life. Because all things what? What all things? All the things that you've been doing in obedience to God, that's what is it was talking all things, all things you've been carrying out. They're going to be working together for your good because you've been doing the Word of God. <clears throat> and so those being the called ones according to purpose. So, first of all, this statement's applied to those who are being called ones according to His purpose. This part back here, which would be all Christians. So, that's great. But the other part is not talking about all Christians. It's now a qualified statement because it's talking about to those loving God. That as a conditional statement. So we got a statement to those con loving God conditional, and then we got a statement to those who are called according to His purpose, which is everybody, all Christians. So that means that statement is true for all Christians, called according to His purpose, if they've met the conditions of loving God. So, the point being is, does God only have certain ones that He's called? As these people try to say when they get to the next part about, be, they think it's predestined, only certain ones. No, this is for everybody. But, you've got to meet the conditions to see all these things working together for your good. That is important. It's for all Christians to see it if they meet the conditions reason I say that now, so what does that tell us? That means all things are not working together for everybody's good unless they met the conditions. So you can't just throw that nice little verse out. It's on all the plaques and all the stores, you know, and so forth. You know, they got that up there. You know, all things are working together for my good, and people quote that all the time. And uh, I say, well, have you had any negative things happening? Well, yeah. Was that working together for your good? Yeah, because God said so. They throw their minds out the window. Sickness disease is not working together for my good. Someone who got sick and got in the hospital, you know, and died, that wasn't working together for his good. No way. It's amazing that people will believe these kind of things. For whom he did foreknow, now we're getting to this, and who are that? The ones he did foreknow are the ones who become born again. Because who does he know? The ones who got born again. All right. He did predestinate, or this really means to for a point, a point before, literally. So the guys who got born again, he has appointed them before, what? To be conformed, there's no to be there, but conformed to the image of his son. That means all Christians that are born again have been appointed to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That means they're to become like Him. That He might be a firstborn, the firstborn among many brethren. He's supposed to become like Jesus. Now, the reason we point this out is because this is what God wants Christians to be. He wants them appointed to become conformed to the image of His Son. Are we, is everybody conformed to the image of His Son? No. Remember, we, get, we go from glory to glory to become to the very image of His Son. Well, that means that's a process. Something is working to accomplish this. And also, the other thing is, where this word conformed is, it's used two times. Once conformed to here, a second time fashioned like unto. Let's look at that for just a moment. Philippians 3, 21. Who shall change our vile, vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? That's where this word is used, fashioned like unto. There it is, the same word. 
Well, that means that there's going to be some kind of a work that it gets accomplished to bring it into this glorious body, a work accomplished. Because the conformed or fashion is implying a work gets accomplished to produce something. The point being is that when it says this back here in Romans, it is implying a work being accomplished to bring us into the image of Jesus. Why is that important? Because this doesn't mean we already are in the image of Jesus, nor does it mean the fact that it's going to automatically happen because God wants that to be. No, the work has to be accomplished to see that come to pass. He did, he wants us, foreappointed us to be seeing this work accomplished, to be fashioned like and for, to the image of His Son. And again, we know it's a process. Again, that scripture we quoted before, good example, where it talks about 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face beholding as a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. Well, that didn't mean it just all of a sudden happened just because God wanted to do it. No. Into the same image, how did we get to that place? From glory to glory. Well, that means it was a work accomplished, a process going on. So the people that think that God just automatically does things without a work accomplished is what they teach about that. You're just predestined, it's going to happen automatically. Not so. The work has to be accomplished to see this come to pass. The reason why we tell you that is because you'll see what it says in the following verses as we go. So, in verse 30 now, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, same word, how he appointed before to be conformed into the image, to see this work be accomplished. Them he also called, meaning we've been called to see this work be accomplished to come into the image of Jesus. That's a call of God. You have a call. And whom he called to see this work be done, them he also justified. But see, the false teaching out there is that, well, he called us, that means that everybody's automatically justified just because we were called. No. Those he called are the ones who had to see this work be accomplished. In other words, the work had to be accomplished because that was the call of God to bring you into the place of being conformed to his image. Whom he called, which are the ones who acted on that, them he also justified or declared righteous. Because who gets declared righteous? Somebody just born again and that's it? No. Who's righteous? The one who's doing the word of righteousness, has the fruits of righteousness, and has accomplished this work to be righteous before the Lord. See, this is where they come along and they say, well, this is, you're automatically justified because he predestinated this. And he foreknew that, and you, you've already been, it's already been set by God, and it doesn't matter what you do. This is used by once saved, always saved people to try to prove that which is wrong, because this speaks of a work being accomplished that you're called to, to bring you to the place of being fashioned or conformed to the image of his son. And furthermore, who he called, just because you're called, did that automatically get you justified? Well, we know that can't be true because remember it says many are called and few are chosen. <laughs> well, if everybody's called and they're automatically justified, they'd be chosen, wouldn't they? So how could only just a few be chosen then? Are you with me? Yeah. In other words, this thinking that whoever's called is automatically justified or declared righteous. Is that so? No. You've got to have seen the process be accomplished, the work accomplished. Because we know, again, that would be a contradiction if everybody called is going to be justified, and whoever's justified is glorified. Uh, and that means they're, everybody called is glorified. That's only if they meet the conditions, isn't it? See, this would be a contradiction if only the call, called people were declared righteous. It'd be a contradiction to many are called and few are chosen. Well, if I'm called and I'm justified, I'm obviously chosen. But when it says many are called and few are chosen, that means, well, there must be some conditions for somebody being chosen. That's right. 
And this doesn't, there's no contradiction in the scripture. This is talking about those who have a call to be appointed as God purposes for them to come to the place of being conformed, fashioned into the image of his son, which is a work accomplished. In other words, this is not a once saved, always saved passage of scripture that people have tried to say, you're predestinated to that, and it's set. You're predestinated, so therefore you're called, so you're righteous, so you're glorified, everything's fine. Not so. Can you understand where I'm following? It's a deception because they have not understood the truth about what this is talking about. And furthermore, it's a contradiction with the other scriptures because who gets justified? Only the ones who are doing the word of righteousness because this means rendered righteous. Where, are those, where, where do we see that from? 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Huh. That's not just the guy who was called to be something or the, without action or doing any work accomplished or the guy that was predetermined that that's what he's supposed to be. See, they take that as once saved, always saved, and try to make a case out of it and they, it's a deception, it's a lie. It is not talking about that because the ones who are called have to carry out the call to be righteous. You have to fulfill it by doing what the Word says. Just because you're called doesn't make me righteous. <laughs> and just because I'm called doesn't make me glorified. No way. You've got to meet the conditions. And look at this verse as well. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness, he's not of God. <laughs> well, that means just because you're called, well, suppose I'm not doing righteousness. God says you're not of God. Well, that one said I was justified and glorified, so everything's fine. No, because you misunderstood. The call has to have a work accomplished in order to be come to the place of being conformed fashioned like to the image it is a process having been accomplished. So we share that with you for you understand the false teaching of Romans chapter 8 verse 28 to verse 30. Thinking that all things are working together for my good automatically and God predetermined me and so that I am, he called me so I'm righteous and so I'm glorified. It's all set, doesn't matter what I do. It's totally contrary to the word. It's all lying teachings that have come forth. We are called to be justified. And we are called to be conformed to the image of Jesus. But the work has to be done to bring you to that place. It's not done just because you were bo born again or just because you have a call on your life. You've got to fulfill the call of God. I trust that's been able to help you and you understand what we've said. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. This means that he didn't change his mind on the gifts and callings of God. Because when you look this up, this word here uh, in Freiburg's, it means incapable of being changed, not to be taken back, and the UBS irrevocable. If God's called you, the call's there. Well, suppose I didn't walk in the call or receive the call or turned away from the call. It doesn't matter. You know, it's still there. Get on board and start walking in line with it. Fulfill that call. The gifts that he's given you and the callings of God, are he doesn't take them back. You might shut them down by not doing what he says, but they're still there. That's important. I've seen people who have a call of God on their life and then they walked away and they thought, well, it's all over, I can't do anything. No, it's not so. You get in line because the gifts and callings of God, he doesn't take them away. They're still there. You may have missed it somewhere along the line, but get on board and start doing what he says so you see this be being fulfilled in your life because it's on your life. The gifts have been given. The call's on your life. You've got to carry it out. Don't think that it's, it's not there anymore. It is there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, 
a called apostle, not to be an apostle, a called apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Meaning, how are you called? It's not you deciding it. It's not someone else deciding it. It's by God, the will of God. You can't decide what you're going to do. You got to find out what God wants you to do according to His purpose. That's why you seek Him and He'll reveal what He wants for you to do. You're called, it's through the will of God. And then we come to verse 2. Under the church of God is at Corinth, notice this, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is a perfect tense, meaning they have been sanctified, completed action in the past with present results by God. Called, not to be, called saints. Otherwise, they're holy ones. They have fulfilled this and seen this sanctification process be accomplished in the past with present results. Oh, they've seen the work done. They're called holy ones. That's what they are. And to show you that this to be isn't there at all, here it is. This is the word called. The called ones, adjective plural. And this is the word holy ones, adjective plural as well. Called ones that are holy ones. That is what they become because they saw the sanctification process accomplished. So he's writing to those at Corinth but then look at what he says also after that. With, meaning this is now another group of people, all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. The point being is this letter was written not only to the ones that had seen the sanctification process already completed, but he's also writing to everybody else who's called upon the name of the Lord, which is just all Christians in general. Two classifications of people ones that have entered in and have seen the work accomplished, and one that's calling upon the name of the Lord, but apparently they're on the road, but they haven't seen that accomplished yet, otherwise they would have been, wouldn't have the separation of the ones who have been sanctified, as opposed to are calling upon the name of the Lord. Who calls upon the name of the Lord? Someone who's born again. The point being is we've got two separate groups that he's speaking here. God, there's those that are the sanctified, the ones that have seen it, and we've got also just the Christians in general, but it's to everybody. The Word of God is, these guys had seen the work done. These guys are a work in process to get the work done. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's another thing. We're called to have fellowship with Him. That means to know Him, to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. This means a partnership, a participation with, a close, intimate fellowship with Him. You know Him. You walk with Him. You abide, you're abiding in, in the presence of the Lord. You're one of His. You're like the sheep that hear His voice and He knows you and He knows you by name because you've developed a personal, intimate fellowship. So we're called to that. So don't ever think that you're supposed to be, God, He's going to be a distant person or distant God out there. No. You're to see an intimate, personal fellowship be established with the Lord, with you. That is a call of God upon your life. So get that mindset. You know, some people think he's kind of just distant out there. You know. No, that's a wrong way of thinking. You're not thinking correctly. You're called to intimate, personal fellowship with him. Verse 24, But unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God. So we've been called, and what are we called? When we're called, we, of course, receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and the Spirit of Christ comes into us. And what through Christ, what's going to come? The power of God and the wisdom of God. He is the source for it. So you're called, as one is in Christ, to get the power of God in you and to get the wisdom of God in you. Remember in the, in the book of Acts, they got full of power, they got full of wisdom, they got full of faith, they got full of the Holy Ghost. Well, how could that be? Because the power of God is going to come to you from Him. The point being is you're called to get full of the power of God. You're called to have the wisdom of God. And it's going to come through Jesus Christ. So don't think that you can't have it. 
You're to be a dynamo full of power and you are to see the wisdom of God be operating in you so you walk in wisdom at all times. You got to get the mindset thinking correctly. Verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren. Aye, who's he call? He calls those that will come to him and yield themselves to him. Look what he doesn't call. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, powerful ones, not many noble, noble race ones. <laughs> Otherwise, he just doesn't look out there and say, oh, I see this guy, he's, he, he's one of nobility. And he, oh, he's powerful. Oh, he's rich, you know, call him. Not so. He doesn't call people by some uh, special group or special thing that they are in the flesh or in the world. No. He calls those, of course, what's the opposite? <laughs> you humble yourself. You become like a little child. That's not someone that's noble and, you know, the nobility, I think they're higher and above everybody else. <laughs> no. Nobody in Christ is above anybody else whatsoever. He's looking for people that'll be yielded to him. So, it's not these wise men after the flesh and the mighty ones and the ones that are of nobility whatsoever. In fact, it says God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God is just looking for people that are yielded vessels that will submit unto him. And that's what you and I are to be. We come over to chapter 7 and we pick up in verse 17. As God hath distributed to every man as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. In other words, whatever God has given unto you, you are to walk in that calling. As the Lord has called everyone, so let him walk in that calling. Whatever he's given you. You want to find out what he's given you. Things he's given you, you walk in it. You carry it out. You do it. We see to verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Don't decide you're going to be something else. No, you abide in the calling you've been called to. The same calling, you abide in it, you stay in it, and you carry it out. If that's what you're called to do, you make sure that you're carrying that call out in your life. Otherwise, you don't switch calls or decide I'm going to be something else. Or, wow, I think I'd like to be a prophet instead or whatever, you know. If you're not called to be that, that's not what you're going to be. Don't even think about it. You be what God wants you to be and not try to get outside of what he would call you to be. And you stay in that same calling. Are you called being a servant? Care not for it. Thou mayest be made free. Use it rather. Otherwise, if you, are, if, you, know, if you get free, then you can, you, whatever, it doesn't matter what your situation is, bond or free, you still serve the Lord as a servant of him. He that's called in the Lord being a servant, he's the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that's called being free, he's Christ's servant. Because you and I are the Lord's free man and we're a servant of him. We're always to be a servant. Those are the ones, remember the servant is the greatest of all. We saw that this morning in many scriptures. You're bought with a price. Be not the servants of men. You're to be a servant of God. You're not to be serving men. See, a lot of some people, they'll serve men instead of serving God because they thought, you know, so they really have compromised in serving men for usually selfish reasons or some way I can get ahead or whatever it might be. No, you are to be a servant of God. Brethren, let every man wherein he's called, therefore abide with God. Whatever he's called you to, you abide in it. You are responsible to carry that out. Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 6. You know, it makes me think of, I've heard these guys that are, that are called in one thing, and then they decide they're going to be something else. And they try to move over into another thing, and then they flop. I wonder why, what happened? Uh, I thought that's what God wanted me to do. No, God never told me to do that. They decided to do that. And they crashed. <laughs> and there was no fruitfulness, no victory in their ministry or whatever they were doing. Because they didn't stay in the same calling that God had set them in. To begin with. Galatians 1 verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What did these guys do? 
They went back into the Old Testament law. Is the Old Testament law the gospel that brought the grace of God? No. It's the New Testament law under Jesus Christ. They went back, they got deceived and went back into it. Don't ever let yourself be deceived to go back into the Old Testament ways or carrying out any of those things of the flesh that are made for the people after the flesh which were in the Old Testament era. You're now born of the Spirit. You are now to walk after the Spirit and you are to function according to the Gospel of the New Testament. Verse 15. When it, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. This is Paul. Well, he was, uh, he was uh, you know, a Pharisee of Pharisees and top guy, you know, uh, in the, of the Pharisees and the Jews, Hebrew of Hebrews, and he excelled everybody in the law and so forth, and yet he got it revealed to him. I was separated from my mother's womb and called by God. He didn't know about it, though, but he found out later on it was a call of God upon his life. And he responded to it. He could have rejected it, but he responded to it. And that's important. You know, you have to realize whatever God has called you to, more than likely it's been from your mother's womb. You've had that call all your life. You may not have realized it yet, but the call's been there. You know? I remember myself, I didn't know that I had a call of God whatsoever until I was, what, about almost 30 years old when I was ordained in the ministry. But you know, I realized after that that I did have a call of God. And I remember that I went to one, my mother took me when I was in a, a junior high to one of these places where they do um, testing to find out what, like what your, what, what your app aptitude is for, a career education type of thing, which, which you're kind of apt to be. And mine came up, the number one thing said, you're suited for a minister. And I wasn't born again or knew nothing at the time. I just passed that one off because I knew nothing at that point. But now I look back, well, after I got born again and, got in the, and so God took me in the ministry, I look back and see, yeah, that's why that came out that way. I was called, I already had, God had already put those things in me from the very beginning. And I'm sure he's put whatever he has into you from the very beginning. We just have to come to the place of receiving it and understanding what our call is. And that's what he came to. He said, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me. Praise God. Seek him for whatever he has for you. He'll reveal it to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Well, if God calls you, of course, which he did, we're supposed to obey the truth. What happened to these guys? They were running well at one point, but then they got off track. Don't ever let yourself get off track of doing the word. They quit obeying the truth. Well, the truth is what the, Jesus brought forth. Truth, remember, grace and truth came by him, not the Old Testament law. That wasn't what they were to be obeying. They got off track and went right back into it. That tells us something. If you're going to be obeying the call of God, you're going to fulfill that. You're going to be obeying the truth. You're going to be doing what the Word says in the New Testament. Don't let anything hinder you from obeying the truth. You must put the Word of God first place. We see in Galatians 5.13, what else? He says, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty. We've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Oh, I'm free so I can do anything I want. <laughs> That's what some people believe out there. The once saved, always saved crowd, you know. No, you're called unto liberty you got to walk it out. You're going to be, you're going to speak and do according to the law of liberty because you're going to be judged according to it. You just don't decide I'm going to do whatever I want to do, occasion of the flesh. Of course, he says, by love, be serving one another. You've been called to liberty. You need to walk in line with the law 
of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, because remember, as we were just quoting, that's what you and I are going to be judged by, so you don't turn away from it. Speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That's right. We've got to walk in line with it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. The eyes of your, not really understanding, that's a different word in the Greek, this is the word dianoi, which really means your way of thinking. Um, that's, that's what they bring out here, which is really, because of noe is the word for mind, and dia means through the mind, so it's, it's a way of thinking now in the mind. The eyes of your way of thinking is to be enlightened through the word. God will open up the eyes of your mind that you may know what's the hope of his calling, the confident expectancy of his calling. So he's going to reveal it to you. You know, he's going to reveal it to your mind. You're going to know what he wants. And he's going to, you're, then you're going to be able to follow it. God will reveal things to you. Understand that he's going to reveal what his calling of God, the confident expectancy, which is what hope of his calling. And if you, it'll be, God will bring revelation to you. This is going to be revelation, remember. This is all about he gives you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Not that you've tried to figure it out yourself or interpret it and figure out, or somebody told you something and so I guess I'm supposed to do such and such, you know. Somebody told me I'd be, I should go be a missionary to, to you know, far away place or something. Well, if God didn't call you to that and you don't know it and he hadn't revealed it to you, forget it. Unless he reveals it to you. You've got to have him reveal it to you. Don't just run off on what someone might say. He works through revelation to open your eyes to know the hope of his calling, of the things that he has for you in your life. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. Beseech, by the way, means to call you alongside. That you would walk worthy of the vocation, which is the calling, it means, wherewith you are called. Well, that tells us that whatever you're called to, you've got to have the walk. You've got to walk it out. You're going to walk worthy of this calling wherewith you were called. So you have a calling, but you're going to have to walk it out. This is a, shows that it was God's calling upon your life, were called, but you're going to have to walk worthy of it. Well, that means you're going to be showing the fact that you're obeying what he tells you to do. If you have a call of God, which every one of us do, get with a program and do it. Carry out the things that he wants you to do. I remember that when I was a claims jester for five years, and as I was praying for what God wanted me to be doing, and they wanted to promote me to be a supervisor and shift me to a different office, but I knew that that wasn't what God had for me. And as I was praying, my desire to be involved in that just went right out the window. It's the best way I know how to describe it. I don't want to do this anymore. And it wasn't from me, it was from God on the inside. And he started putting the desire into me that I was supposed to go to Bible school. I didn't even know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know I was called to do anything. But he put that desire in me, and I knew it was God. And so I gave my notice and went to the place where God had directed you to. You've got to be ready to do what God wants you to do and carry it out and act. We can't wait around for nothing, you know, forever. If God puts it in your heart to do it, you follow the steps that he gives you, and you carry out those steps. That's what I did. And then the steps just went. You know, he starts taking you where he goes, where he's going to take you to, to, and he'll provide and do everything. I'll never forget how he provided. Walked, went, went down to this place, the Bible school, and went in there, had no place to go. Had everything with me and uh, introduced myself and said I'd come to the Bible school. And they said, uh, I said, do you guys have any place for uh, Bible school students to live? Uh, no, you're just supposed to get your own place. And she says, but let me, uh, there was somebody in our, that's in our church here in this area that called in and said today, they called in today and said they were moving out of state 
and they had a trailer uh, that they wanted to rent, but they couldn't find anybody to rent, so they wanted to just let any Bible school students that might come along, they could just have it for free and just pay the utilities. They called in in the morning. I showed up about one o'clock. They told me that, I said, I called them immediately. Went out there and, and found their, got, met with them. They were gonna leave that night, flying out. We got the place. Got to order your steps right on time and got the place. When God's called you, he'll open up the doors that no man can shut, shut the doors that no man can open and lead you and guide you. But we gotta make the steps. Whatever God tells you to do, do it and watch God move in the situation. He will. He'll do tremendous things. How, what are we called to do? We walk worthy of the vocation. How are you going to walk? You've got to have these qualities. Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, holding up one another. Oh, this is all the character of the Lord. Uh, being diligent, spadazzo is the word, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what he wants. So we're going to walk in the way of the, the, the bond of peace. That means we're not going to have relationship problems. We're going to be always being show lowliness and humility and meekness and long suffering and holding one another up in love. That's what God wants. You've got to be committed to follow the call of God. You should never have relationship problems. You should put the word of God first place and always be doing what he says. Lowliness is humility. Meekness is a gentleness and a mildness. You know, harshness, no. <laughs> no way. You got to get that cast out and get rid of that out of your life. Long suffering. Not getting frustrated and throwing in a towel and so forth, giving up on th this or that. And holding up one another. Not tearing them down and being critical. We got to get the character of the Lord established in us. Over in Philippians, chapter 3. We've looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again. This is Paul. And he comes, he says, that I may know him, we're to come to that place, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings made conformable unto his death. We're going to become just like Jesus that I, by any means, as he gets conformed to being like Jesus, by any means I might attain, I might arrive and come to the resurrection of the dead. Paul, the one who's writing all these things, who got this tremendous revelation, and out there preaching the gospel and doing these things, and he hasn't come to this yet? That's right. We're all a work in progress. It's a process in us. He hadn't said I, that I might attain. It's not guaranteed yet to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained or already arrived, taken this and come to this place. Either we're already perfect, because he understood who's the one who attains to the resurrection, the ones that are perfect, that go to perfection. Remember the ones who are in heaven? The righteous ones made perfect, he says. But I'm running after, Dioko, if that I may lay hold of that for which I have been laid hold of of Christ. He laid hold of us so we could go and lay hold of all that he has to go on to perfection and attain to the resurrection of the just and become, get what we're supposed to get, the prize. Brethren, I count not myself to have laid hold of, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, you know, if you've had a lot of negative things happen in your life, you got to let go of it. Don't harbor things of the past. Let it go. You're going to get set free from it, but don't sit there and be looking back, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth, or it means stretching out, stretching yourself forward to the things that are before. Get your focus on what God has and move forward. Don't look back. Don't let the things of the past hold you down or pull you down. He says, I'm running, Dioko. I'm running after the goal, this is the mark or the goal, for the award to the victor. 
of the heavenly, remember we talked about this word means above, the heavenly, the above calling of God in Christ Jesus. That means the calling of God is a heavenly calling from above that you are to be running after the goal for the award to the victor, which means the only way you're going to come to this is you've got to win the victory. You've got to get the victory over all the enemies. You've got to get the victory over sin, over the flesh, over the devil, over the world, over anything. And you're able to get the victory. God has given you the victory and it caused you to always triumph in all things in Christ. If God be for you, who can be against you? <laughs> you can win every battle. You can get every victory and possess every promise that belongs unto you. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. You've got to set your mind, I'm going on to perfection. Anything in my life that's not of God, I'm destroying it. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm not going to let it keep working at me. I'm going to go after it and get it put underfoot. I'm going to cast it out. I'm going to correct it. I'm going to get the word in me. I'm going to be ready to deal with anything that comes against me. I'm not going to fall for any more of the tricks of the devil. No, I'm going to be perfect. Be thus minded. If anything be otherwise reminded, God will reveal it unto you. He says, nevertheless, where until we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Otherwise, never lose anything that you've gained. Well, I was walking right, and I got off track somehow, and I'm not like I used to be. Well, get back on the program and not let the devil have place any longer. Whatever you attain to, you walk by that. You proceed in a row as the march of a soldier, going in order, that means. Because you're ordering your life in line with the Word of God, and that's the way you walk because you're fulfilling the call of God. See, the call of God is for you to be righteous, to be holy. The call of God is to you to have the character of Jesus. The call of God is for you to have total victory in your life. The call of God is for you to be like a soldier going in order and seeing God accomplish everything in your life. And the call of God, you're to abide in it and carry it out in your life. Do everything He says. You go through the cleansing process to be made useful for the calling of God. All these things, that is what God has for every single one of us. 1 Thessalonians, a couple more scriptures before we stop. Chapter 2, verse 12. That you would walk worthy. We already saw about walking worthy of that calling that we've been called to. That was about having lowliness and humility, you know, and gentleness, the, the meekness and the long-suffering and all those things, holding one another in love. Now you're to walk worthy of God who has called you or not like he already did it and it's a, that was in the past and that's all there is to it. No, because it's a present tense. Is calling you ongoingly. The call of God's on you every day of your life. It's ongoing. Is calling you unto his kingdom and glory. He's called you to the kingdom and the glory. You've got to do what's necessary for the entrance into the kingdom and to see the glory of God be manifest. You're to see this come to pass in your life. Look what he says over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that means you're supposed to come to obtain the obtaining of it. You're going to get, the, you're going to get this manifest in your life because you're going to do what's necessary to see it come to pass. And we want to jump ahead to one other scripture before we stop. Because if you've been called to the glory and to the kingdom and you're to see it come to pass, you're going to have to see this work accomplished to bring you to that place. 2 Peter 1.10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make for yourself... Say, well, I thought God was just going to do everything and I just kind of watch Him do whatever He wants to do. No. Present tense, middle voice, continually making yourself 
your calling and election or being chosen sure and steadfast. Well, that means you've got a part to play in this deal. See, many people just think the call of God and then it's automatically whatever God calls me will just happen. No, it won't. It all depends on whether you carry it out and you do see the work accomplished in you and you do all the things he says to see it. Give diligence. This is a command to you and me. God says, be diligent to be making for yourself ongoingly your calling and election to be sure, set, fast, firm. If you are doing these things, you might never fall. Well, that means there's some work for you to do. If you're doing these things, subjunctive mood, you might never fall. Or not to fall. Well, if you fall, are you making your calling and election sure? No. How are you going to make your calling and election sure? By doing the things so you don't fall. He didn't want you to fall whatsoever. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom. Remember, we're called to obtain the kingdom and the glory. Well, this is one of the ways you enter into the kingdom and what's necessary for the entrance into it because you have done what was necessary by giving diligence to be making for yourself your calling election sure because you're doing the things he says. And you won't fall. You say, what do you mean? I didn't... They always tell you you're always going to fall. They told you lies. Don't listen to them. Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to guard, philoso, you from falling. Don't ever believe you're supposed to, you, you are going to fall or, and well, everybody falls, you know. Only the ones that don't know what they're doing and are, uh, believe the lies if he will guard you from falling, if you do what he says, you won't fall. Your days of falling are to be over. You're to walk uprightly in obedience, in perfection, walking in righteousness and holiness all the time. That's the way it is. That's the way we walk. That's what we're coming to. And to present you faultless we got brought that message about walking unblameably, uh, without blame and unblameably and without respect, without, uh, unrebukable and unreprovable in his sight. He'll present you faultless without blemish. Well, that sure throws out that all the teaching that says that we're always going to fall, we're always going to sin, we're always going to make mistakes. You know, you know, God understands all your problems and things you've been through. <laughs> Don't listen to any of that stuff. Yeah, he understands and he knows what he wants you to do. Conquer and overcome everything and never fall. That's where we're headed. That's what we're called to. Would God call us to something that we wouldn't see realized in our life? No way. In fact, we'll close with this last scripture. If he's called you, how do I know it's going to get done? If you do what the Word says... Faithful is he that's called you who also will do it. Always remember this scripture. Whatever God, God's called you to, all these things he's called us to, God will do it. But you do have a part to play because you've got to be making for yourself your calling and election sure by doing what he says. Just like in order to see yourself declared righteous of the call, you're going to have to do what's necessary the work accomplished to be conformed, fashioned to the image of Jesus like we talked about. Otherwise, you're going to be working out, same thing, you're going to be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, always obeying, knowing that God's at work to will and do of His good pleasure. He'll accomplish the work. Do what the Word says and He'll perform it. Meet all the conditions, the call of God will be fulfilled. And this is absolutely essential because, remember, Many are called, but only few are chosen. The only ones that get chosen are the ones that have fulfilled the call. The ones that don't fulfill the call, they're not chosen. Therefore, 
God would never, it would be unfair for him to dangle a call before you and say, well, I know you're never going to get there. No, everybody's to get there. Why are only few chosen? Because they didn't do what was necessary to fulfill the call of God. The call of God is a good call for you to carry out everything that he wants in your life and to bring you into the very image of Jesus, to be like him, to come, overcome everything in your life and to come to the place where whatever the purpose is and, and the ministry has for you, whatever he wants you to do, you're going to enter into it and you're going to carry it out in your life. And then you're going to hear at the end of your days, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. Have authority over many things or have authority over ten cities or whatever it might be. Hey, what we're doing now is training and working out our salvation for where we're going to be in the future. Don't waste your time. Don't let yourself fall. Don't let yourself give place to anything that's not of God. Get on board on fulfilling the call of God in your life, and God will do a great work. Put him first place. The call of God, you must carry it out in your life. It's mandatory, so you'll be chosen. Remember, who's coming back? I guess we have to show this last scripture. Who's coming back with Jesus when they want to fight against him? These are the ones that have been in the marriage supper of the Lamb and are coming back with him. Those that are with him are called ones. These are all adjective, plural. Chosen ones. Faithful ones. That's to be what you are labeled as. I'm a called one, and I'm a chosen one, and I'm a faithful one because I've done everything he says so that I am chosen and I am found faithful. Praise God for the great work he's doing. Get excited about what God's doing in your life. Get excited about where you're headed for. Forget the things behind. Paul says, I'm forgetting all that stuff. I mean, remember, this is the guy that hauled off the Christians into prison and was responsible for, for all the evil things that went on. He's, why, he's holding the clothes while they're stoning Stephen. He says, I'm the least of them all. But I don't come behind one whit from all the apostles. In fact, who's the guy that really was exalted by God? God was the one who exalted him because he did what was necessary. He let God accomplish everything in his life, and he wrote most of the New Testament. Well, God wants you to work every, everything out in your life and fulfill the call of God, and he will do a tremendous work. Don't let yourself be taken uh, by the things of this world or all this other stuff that are just a bunch of time wasters. Learn to watch your words, govern your mind, make your right choices, guard your heart, don't let any garbage come in, don't hear voices of strangers. You can't be a sheep if you're hearing a voice of a stranger. <laughs> if you're hearing strangers, shut them off. Turn them off, get away from them. That's why I say if anybody's watching the TV and the movies or any of the things of the world, what are you doing? <laughs> no way. I don't want to hear strangers. They're going to come in and pollute you. And that's what will happen. But if we walk in the way of the Lord, we'll fulfill the call of God. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the call of God that's upon my life. I will obey and do what you say to see the call of God be accomplished in my life. I will be diligent to be making for myself the calling and being chosen sure and set fast because I'm a doer of the word and I will not fall and I'm going to carry out everything you've told me to do. I'm going to meet all the conditions and see the character of the Lord accomplished in me and I will carry out the call of God and see God accomplish everything that he purposes for me in my life. Thank you that you are faithful to do it. 
I will see you do it because I will do what you say. Thank you for performing it in my life. So I'll be chosen and I'll be found faithful and I'll be with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Set yourself to do it. That's what I've done. And I have to, I have to do it every day. I have to do everything God wants. You have to follow him every day. You can't get off track ever. You've got to walk this walk and stay on course. Just like Paul says, hey, I haven't attained yet, but I'm running after it. I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to see this come to pass. You set yourself. That's the way I'm going to be. I mean, if you aren't, if you aren't on fire for doing the things of God, there's something wrong. Get a hold of yourself. <laughs> get tuned in so God can accomplish the things he wants in your life. He'll do it. But be ready to obey in all situations. Thank you, Father, for all you brought forth. We'll be doers of the word. We will fulfill the call of God as we do what you say, and we know you'll accomplish it in our life. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We've got more to talk about. This call of God is extremely important.